Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for all that you're doing. And thank you for being people of faith who care about this country and love this country enough to fight for it. I'm fighting right there with you, and I'm honored to be here. So, so thrilled that you had me tonight. Um, I, I want to, before I, I, I kick off my remarks, I want to offer a couple of notes of appreciation to so many of the dear friends that I have here. Uh, I want to start, of course, with uh, Ralph Reed. Ralph, thank you not just for the kind introduction, uh, but for your years of friendship. I first met Ralph, actually, when I was running in my primary race in the state uh, for the Republican Senate race in the state of Ohio. I think we had a connection from the very beginning, I think, because we're both people of faith who care a lot about ensuring that our country lives according to the common good. And so Ralph and I have been close for a long time and, of course, uh, thrilled, to, thrilled to be here this evening um, I also want to recognize some other VIPs who are here this evening. We have, of course, your incredible, uh, patriotic, and very effective Governor Brian Kemp with his lovely wife, Marty. <laughs> Brian and Marty, thank you both. The lights are really bright, so I can't see anybody that I'm introducing, so please just stand up or wave. Uh, I won't be able to see it, but the people behind us will. I want to thank Georgia Attorney General Chris Carr. Where's Chris? And my, my dear colleague and one of my favorite people in politics, the great senator from Alabama, Katie Britt. Katie, thank you. You have some of the very best congressmen uh, and public servants in the state of Georgia. Uh, I know that Mike Collins is here. We're thrilled to have Mike. Thank you so much, Mike. We have, I think, the best name in the United States Congress, Barry Loudermilk. Barry, where are you? I know we're so grateful to have, not just here tonight, but on the Trump team, we have the great Tulsi Gabbard, former Democratic Congresswoman, but a true superstar. And a true patriot. And, and, and by the way, you know, people think about our party right now. Think about the incredible team that we have. We have Brian Kemp, Donald Trump, Nikki Haley, Tulsi Gabbard, and Bobby Kennedy Jr. What an amazing team of patriots fighting for this country. But of, of course, there's a lot of disagreement between those two, those, those, those five individuals I just named. And amazingly, amazingly, they're all on Trump's team for 2024 because we are the party of common sense. We can disagree, we can disagree amicably, but we've got to get common sense back in the White House, and that's why we're going to elect Donald J. Trump. I want to thank Georgia Commissioner of Labor Bruce Thompson. Bruce, thank you. And finally, I want to thank Bishop Kelvin Cabarrus. Thank you, Bishop. God bless you. And thank you for being here. Thank you, Bishop. Now, I want to just talk a little bit about my own faith journey. And some of you have heard a little bit about this, including a, probably a, an event hosted by Ralph Reed. But a lot of you probably don't know a whole lot about how I left the faith but eventually came back to it. And I think it's instructive because it lets you know a little bit how, who I am, but it also maybe lets you know a little bit about how I think about the challenges confronting our country. Now, I, I was raised by a working class grandmother because my mother struggled with opioid addiction for a big chunk of my early life. And my mamaw, for those of you who haven't read the book, that's what I called my grandmother. She was a woman of, of profound and very thoughtful Christian faith. She even though she hadn't graduated from high school, my grandmother thought more about the, what the Christian faith required of her and required of me than any person that I've ever met. She read the Bible every single day, and she was a person who loved the Lord with all her heart. Now, she was also a woman of great tensions, because as much as she loved the Lord, she also loved the F word. And I will say, as, as the father now of a seven-year-old boy, a four-year-old boy, and a two-year-old girl, there are real consequences to talking like Mamaw did at home. And, you know, the, 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 the person who I'm, of course, most thrilled to have here, with all due respect to the dignitaries and leaders here today, is, of course, my lovely wife, Usha. Usha, it's...
And I think a lot of you have gotten to know Usha and, and, and fallen in love with Usha just as I have because she's this, this incredible combination of beauty and grace and dignity and intelligence. And hopefully my wife would say some nice things about me, but the one thing that she wouldn't say is that I always talk diplomatically at home. And I, I sometimes wish, honey, the one thing that maybe you wish you could take back is that maybe Mamaw hadn't talked a certain way because now I talk that way too. And I'd ask all of you to forgive me if you ever see me make a misstep on the campaign trail with my language, because, but I came by it honestly because Mamaw really could make a sailor blush with the way that she spoke. And I, I will tell you this story that, you know, we, we have, like I said, three little kids. And when our, our four-year-old was three years old, you know, we would often go back and forth, um, we, you know, go back and forth between Ohio and D.C. And we like to take our kids to D.C. with us and, of course, like to take our kids back home. And, you know, my, my son, we were on a Delta flight. And I remember wondering if anybody on the flight knew who I was. And hopefully they didn't because, you know, I you know, had a baseball cap on and, uh, just didn't look especially especially great, probably hadn't showered that morning, was just, you know, trying to wrangle a three-year-old on the airplane, and then my son drops a Biscoff cookie between the two seats, and he says, well, oh, and I won't repeat it here, because I don't want to offend anybody, but then about 12 heads jerked around and looked at me simultaneously, and everybody knew at that moment that Senator Vance was a terrible father, but... <laughs> Um, I, I, with all kidding aside, while Mamal did have some colorful language, she really, really tried to instill the tenets of the Christian faith in me. Now, we didn't go to church a whole lot. We were what I think a lot of sociologists would call unchurched, but we talked about it a lot. We watched Billy Graham a lot, and we thought a lot about what our Christian faith required of us. Now, unfortunately, like a lot of young people who were raised in the faith, I myself lost my faith when I went to college and started to think that I knew everything. And I know there are a lot of uh, 22-year-olds out there. I, I, I enlisted in the Marine Corps out of high school, and so I was 23 when I started my classes at Ohio State University. And like a lot of kids in their early 20s, I, I assumed that I knew things that Mamaw didn't know. I assumed that her faith came from a place of being backward and not understanding the world, instead of from understanding it a lot better than I did as a 23-year-old young man. And so as I got older, and I thought a little bit about how to control my temper, for example, and I fell in love with this beautiful young girl who became, of course, my wife, I started to think, what was it that I needed to be as a husband? And what was it that I wanted to be as a father? And the more that I thought about those questions, the more I increasingly found the answers in the Christian faith that I had discarded as a young man. And that realization, that realization that the basic truths about being a good man about being a good husband, about being a dedicated father, those truths found their best expression in the Christian faith of my grandmother, and that led me back to Jesus Christ. And that, thank you. And that, I think, leads me a little bit into this campaign and this race and why we're fighting for what we're fighting for. Because in this room, while we're disparaged by the media and disparaged by the Democrats as people who want to force our faith on other people, I think I speak for every single person in this room saying, we don't want to force our faith on anybody. What we want is to recognize and to have motivate us the faith that is, I think, the source of all great truth in human history and especially in this country. That we want our public policy to be motivated by the wisdom of loving thy neighbor that we want our public policy to be motivated by a, an understanding that family is the most important thing in this country. It is the most important institution in our country, and if the family falls, everything else will suffer, and suffer dramatically so. We are motivated, in other words, by living our faith and ensuring that our public policy promotes the common good. And I think that at this moment in time, in 2024, with all the violence and all the negative political rhetoric, we need to remember above and beyond that we must love our neighbors, that we must treat other people as we hope to be treated, and that we must love our God and let it motivate us in how we enact public policy and how we live our faith and how we govern our nation. And that will make America a more prosperous and a healthier 
and a more sane and most importantly, a better nation, a nation with virtue and with truth at its core than anything else. Now, now I think there are a lot of ways in which the wisdom of the Christian faith can influence us and make us much better public servants in 2024. And I think there are so, so many ways in which our current leadership is failing. And failing not just when it comes to matters of economics, not just when it comes to matters of immigration, but when it comes to very basic matters of how do we promote a country where good people can get ahead, where people can live decent and virtuous lives, where people can send their children to schools where they get an education instead of an indoctrination, and where all of us, whatever our faiths, can raise our children in our values rather than having those values destroyed by public authorities. That, I think, thank you. That, I think, is what this election is ultimately about. And I want to talk for a little bit about the issues that affect all of us, whatever our faith are or if we don't have any faith at all. And then I want to talk a little bit about those issues that affect, in particular, people of faith. Because there are real, real battles to be had over the next 45 days. There are real debates to be had over the next 45 days. And I believe, as certain as I stand here today, that Donald J. Trump will be the next president of the United States. But let's talk about why it's so important to make that happen. And clearly, you all agree with me. But let's just say that unless we get better public leadership, let's just start with the issues that affect all of us, whether, they're, whether they're, we're Christian or Jew, secular, Muslim, whatever our faith, everybody wants a prosperous economy. Everybody wants a secure border. Everybody wants to be able to walk their children down the city streets safely without being, thank you, without being accosted by violent criminals or by fentanyl brought in by Mexican drug cartels. These are the things that unite us as Americans. And, and let's just be honest here that on every single policy issue over the last three and a half years, Kamala Harris was a failure. And on every single one of these policy issues from 2017 to 2021, Donald Trump was a raging success. In some ways, In some ways, the question of this election is, do we want to be governed by common sense or do we want to be governed by San Francisco liberal radicalism? And I think that all of us believe that we want to be governed by common sense. We want to be governed by the leadership of Donald J. Trump, and we're going to fight every single day to make that happen. Now, Kamala Harris would lead you to believe, if you actually watch her speeches or you watch her rallies, Kamala Harris would lead you to believe two things that just don't make an ounce of sense. The first is that she has been nowhere near the seat of power for the last three and a half years. You, you, go, you go to a, a Kamala Harris rally, you, which I don't recommend, by the way, but if you're brave enough or you watch one on TV and you see Kamala Harris say, on day one, we're going to tackle the food affordability crisis that affects our country. On day one, we're going to tackle the housing costs that affect our country. On day one, she says, we are going to secure that southern border. And all of us with common sense are listening and saying, Kamala Harris, day one was 1,400 days ago. What have you been doing with all of that power the American people gave you? Now, Katie and I, Katie Britt and I, have only been in politics for all of two years, so maybe we just haven't been in politics long enough to not be ashamed at the sitting vice president staring at the American people and telling them that she's going to do something on day one that she hasn't do, done for three and a half years. I think that takes a special level of shame. And unfortunately, Kamala Harris is maybe the most shameless politician that we have had in the United States in 40 years. So she says it. But let's actually check the record, my friends. We have to remember, this is a person who said that she wanted to defund the police. Now she doesn't. This is a person who said that she wanted to de, uh, excuse me, ban fracking in this country. Now, of course, she says she didn't mean it. This is a person who supported the rioters who burned down Minneapolis in the summer of 2020. She bailed them out of jail. Now she says she didn't actually want to do those things. This is a person who says that she does not believe 
an abortion up to the moment of birth and yet has supported legislation that has done exactly that. Now, I, I, I joke with the president. I say, sir, this person is about to show up with a long red tie and a MAGA hat because she is running away from every single position that she has had for three and a half years. She's running away from every position she's had for 20 years. But we can't let people forget, and when you're out there knocking on doors, let's remind everybody that this is not a person who has run as a reasonable moderate. This is not a person who has governed as a reasonable moderate. As much as Kamala Harris pretends that she agrees with Donald Trump on everything, we know the real deal governed as a successful president doesn't just pretend now that he's running that he believes those things, he actually did them as president. He lowered inflation, he secured the border, he made our streets safer, and that's why we have to put him back in the White House. Now, I want to tell you a particularly heart heartbreaking story. I was in Valdosta, Georgia, of course not too far from here, a couple hours drive, and the sheriffs there took me to the interdiction room. And the interdiction room is where they, all the stuff that they've gotten, they've got, you know, bags and bags of marijuana, they've got fentanyl pills, they've got meth, they've got every drug you can possibly imagine. Of course, they've got a lot of guns there because the cartels tra traffic in illegal drugs, but also in illegal guns. So there's one thing that seems out of place when I'm there in Valdosta, and I say, guys, what, what is going on here? And that's, you know, you got all these drugs here. That looks to me just like a box of candy, a box of nerds candy. And they say, well, sir, that's actually THC and fentanyl. And I say, wait a second. They, the cartels have disguised deadly fentanyl to look like child's candy so that they can make it easier to get into our country. And yet we know that one of those packets of fentanyl is going to end up in one of our neighborhood streets. One of those packets of fentanyl is going to end up in a child's playground. One of those packets of what looks like nerd's candy but is actually a deadly substance is going to end up in our schools. And a kid's going to open up a packet of candy, take a piece of candy out, and lose their life because of it. Now that is a sick and deranged human being that would do anything like that, but it's a sick and deranged human being who would give that person power over the United States of America, and that's exactly what Kamala Harris has done. She has given these drug cartels free reign over our country, and now they're smuggling in deadly drugs that look like child's candy. Now, I know a lot of us in here are parents or grandparents. And yes, kids sometimes do stupid things. I did a lot of dumb things when I was a teenager. But I want our children to grow up in a country where stupid childhood mistakes don't claim their lives. I want them to be able to make a mistake and then learn from it. I want their leaders to protect our city streets so our children can learn from their mistakes rather than have it kill them. And that is maybe the most profound thing that Kamala Harris has taken away from this country. By letting not just drug traffickers, but people who are bringing in the most disgusting substances in the world concealed as child's candy, she has taken something that belongs to every American child, rich or poor, public safety, she's taken it away from them. And that is maybe reason number one why we cannot let Kamala Harris get a promotion to President of the United States. Because as much as she talks a good game, she has governed in a way that has destroyed public safety, that has raised the cost of groceries, that has raised the cost of housing, and that has allowed the drug cartels to run rampant over our country. We can't let her forget it, and when we're out there knocking on doors, we can't let the American people forget it. This election is too important. We just have to tell the truth. Tell the truth about Kamala Harris and tell the truth about Donald Trump and we will win on November 5th and we'll do it together. Now those are the issues that affect everybody, whether, they're whether you're a person of faith or not. Let's talk about the issues that affect people of faith in particular. Because I know that there is a lot of concern here in this room that cultural conservatives are no longer welcome in the Republican Party. And let me tell you, that is absolutely not true. You are always going to be welcome and you will always have the seat at the table in the Republican Party of this president and of this leadership. But let me just say something about one issue in particular. Because for half a century, the pro-life movement worked with unwavering faith, perseverance, and courage to send abortion back to the states, to give the people the decision over abortion policy. Now, the Supreme Court's decision, it was not only a victory for the Constitution, it was a victory, it was a testament to the resolve of tens of millions of pro-life Americans who never gave up on the cause of life. 
Now, we're united in our gratitude and in our admiration for these devoted defenders of the unborn and for the judges, justices, and especially President Trump, whose commitment to defending the law and the Constitution allowed this breakthrough after over 50 years of it not happening. Now, I stand here as the vice presidential nominee saying the Republican Party is proud to be the pro-life and the pro-family party. Now, we believe that human life is precious and every life is worthy of protection because we believe that every child, born and unborn, is created in the image of God. Now, following the Supreme Court's landmark decision, we recognize that the obligation to help nurture and protect the women and the babies all over this country has only just begun. And that's why we've been supporting policies and fighting for policies. Katie Britt has been at the forefront of it that promote the creation of strong, thriving, and healthy families. We want to make it easier for families to have babies, not harder. We want to make it easier for young moms and dads to choose life, and we're going to do it every single day that we're in the government. Now, that includes... That includes supporting efforts to advance prenatal care, fertility treatments, maternal health, and paternal responsibility because we know that very often the reason that some people don't choose life is because there are a lot of young men who aren't stepping up. And we want to change all of that. We want young families to choose life. We want young men to choose fatherhood. We want young people to choose family in this country. And we want to invest in women, especially pregnant mothers who need help welcoming a new child into the world. Sometimes it's scary. I know this. And it's especially scary when a pregnancy is unplanned. But we are going to support mothers and children. We're going to do new investments in counseling, in job training, in help with newborn expenses. We're going to do new investments in education and pregnancy care centers and so much more because we believe that this country must be more welcoming to families. And we're committed to helping as many women as possible choose life and welcome new life into this world. Now, we're going to also protect women from sex traffickers, domestic abusers, and those who coerce women into abortion because it does happen and it shouldn't happen in this country. We're too good of a country to let this happen in the United States of America. And we're going to shut down the flow of sex traffickers at the border that sexually assault young girls and put them into slavery. It is time to stop this madness, and it will when Donald J. Trump is president of the United States. Now, the, the Democrat Party's extremism on abortion, opposing even routine safety regulations, more closely resembles the policies of China, of North Korea, and of the Soviet Union more than any, and more than it resembles any modern democracy. Now, before President Trump, America had the most extreme abortion laws in the world, allowing abortion up to the moment of birth for any reason at all, paid for by taxpayers, and very often with the federal government threatening Christian charities and hospitals that if they didn't do what the progressives wanted them to do, they would get shut down. Now, thanks to President Trump, we have turned the page and our nation has a chance for a fresh start. And today, we all say together, unafraid, we are proud to be the pro-life party in the United States of America. We love babies, we love mothers, we love dads, and we want a nation where every person can have a happy, fulfilling life from the first moment of their existence until their dying day. And I believe that's a pro-life message the whole country can get behind. Now, we have to talk a little bit, not just about the life issue, but also about the religious freedom issue. Because as much as Kamala Harris talks a big game, she does that a lot, about uniting Americans and about respecting everybody, there has been no more radical leadership in this country when it comes to shutting down religious freedom, shutting down crisis pregnancy centers, and trying to force hospitals to do what the far left wants them to do. 
We believe that if you are a Christian organization, you ought to be able to live your conscience and live your faith in the United States of America, and we're going to fight for that every single step of the way. Now, I want to offer you just a couple of final thoughts here before I, I get on and um, get off the stage here and let you guys finish your, your evening. First of all, I want to tell you a little bit about something that happened to me, and, and Ralph, I apologize because you've heard me tell this story, but I think it drives home just how much faith can affect us, even in the smallest ways. Now, the, the night before I gave the RNC welcome speech where I became your next vice president of the United States. I accepted the nomination of President Trump and the whole Republican Party. Like you can imagine, it was a little hard to go to sleep that night. And so it's Tuesday night, and I'm laying in bed, and Usha's, you know, Usha sleeps like a baby, so she's passed out next to me, and I, I, I just cannot get to sleep, and I'm laying there thinking to myself, this is the most important day of my life on Wednesday. I have got to be well slept, and I kind of got stressed out about being underslept for the, this big speech. And I just laid back and I said, Lord Jesus, help me. And I'm not kidding that that was the last thing that I remembered before I drifted off into one of the deepest sleeps that I've ever had in my entire life. And I... And there, you know, there are a lot of people, I'm sure a lot of media professionals here, a lot of folks who are watching who will roll their eyes and say, yeah, you know... A lot of people say prayers, and a lot of people drift off to sleep. It doesn't mean anything, but I, I want to call your attention to one of my great, my favorite theologians, and that's Samuel L. Jackson in the movie Pulp Fiction. And he talks about, you know, he had just dodged bullets, literally dodged bullets. And he talks about whether this was a miracle. He's debating with his friend whether this is a miracle. And he says something, I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but it, this is more or less what he says. He says, look... Whether this is an according to Hoyle miracle is insignificant. You know, whether God finds your car keys, whether God does this or that, that's not what matters. But what does matter is that I felt the touch of God. And in that moment, as much as the world was swirling around me, I felt the touch of God. And I think there are so many ways, big and small, that we have an opportunity as people of faith to get out there and to remind people that while it sometimes seems distant, and while faith is not top of mind for so many people, the touch of God is everywhere in our country. We just have to look for it, we have to pray for it, and we have to make sure our fellow Americans see it. So I want to thank you for being a person of faith, for living your faith. And for getting out there. And, and, and let me just make one final observation here, which is, look, this, these are the first public remarks that I have made since my running mate was nearly assassinated for the second time yesterday. And President Trump, I was actually sitting at home in Cincinnati with my six-year-old, seven-year-old, and uh, I get a phone call, and it says Donald J. Trump. So I answer it, and he says, J.D., you're not going to believe this, but they tried to do it again. And I said, I said the no, they didn't. You're, you're, you're joshing me. What, what's going on here, sir? And he says, no, I, you know, I was playing golf, and uh, the Secret Service found somebody who was trying to shoot me. And I say, oh, my Lord, sir, I'm so glad you're okay. I mean, are, are you doing okay? Are you not just physically okay, but everything's fine? He said, yeah, I'm doing fine. And this is just who Donald Trump is. He said, you know, I'm, I'm a little mad because I was about to make a birdie putt on the sixth hole, and they wouldn't let me finish. <laughs> I mean, guys, literally, like, this happened, I mean, he calls me right after, this is 10 minutes after, and he's, he's pissed off that they won't let him finish his birdie putt, right after they found a guy with an AK-47. But, by, by the way, that, that is kind of the guy that you want to be President of the United States, right? Who's phased by nothing, who's telling jokes afterwards. I think I was without a question bothered by it more than he was, and I was in Cincinnati, Ohio, you know, 100 miles away from where this went down. But I do think that we should take this opportunity to call for a reduction in the ridiculous and inflammatory political rhetoric coming from too many corners of our politics. Look, we can disagree with one another, we can debate one another, but we cannot tell the American people that one candidate is a fascist and if he's elected, it is going to be the end of American democracy. We cannot, as a 
per, as a person affiliated with Kamala Harris, has said that we need to, quote, eliminate Donald J. Trump. A New York Democratic congressman has said that in the past. If you tell the American people that this person is the end of democracy, if you tell the American people that this person needs to be eliminated, most of them, thank God, are going to ignore you, but some crazy person is going to take matters into their own hands and actually listen to the crazy rhetoric that you're putting out there. And I know it's popular on a lot of corners of the left to say that we have a, we have a both sides problem. And I'm not going to say we're always perfect. I'm not going to say that conservatives always get things exactly right. But you know the big difference between conservatives and liberals is that we ha no one has tried to kill Kamala Harris in the last couple of months, and two people now have tried to kill Donald Trump in the last couple of months. I'd say that's pretty strong evidence that the left needs to tone down the rhetoric and needs to cut this crap out. Somebody's going to get hurt by it, and it's going to destroy this country. Somebody is going to get hurt, and you think about what an incredible wound it would open up in the United States of America, all of us. And I promise I will do my part to tone down the rhetoric, but in particular, the people telling you that Donald Trump needs to be eliminated, you guys need to cut it out or you're going to get somebody hurt. So with that, let me just ask you for one final thing. And that is, as Ralph said, you've gone through north of 2 million doors, and you've probably made north of 2 million phone calls. You're going to knock on 10 million doors, and you're going to knock on, or you're going to make 10 million phone calls here in the next two months. I just want to give you every word of encouragement and every word of gratitude. I know that not every door you knock on, there's a friendly person on the other side. I know that not every phone call goes especially well, but you are the very best part of the American constitutional system. Because while the media can tell their lies about people of faith and while the media can tell their lies about Donald Trump, getting out there and talking to people is the best antidote to the dishonesty that exists in this country. You are out there every day fighting for the truth, telling the truth, and I'm grateful for you. So let me just leave you with this thought because I've, I've seen something in the last two months. People always ask me, how are you doing? And the answer is, I'm doing great. I get to go around this country, I get to see it in a totally new light. I wish that I could take every single one of you and give you the perspective on this incredible country that I've gotten over just the last two months. In fact, it's a lot easier in some ways than running for Senate. When I was running for Senate, I rode around in the back of a used Subaru. Now I get to fly around in a plane, right? Not a, not a bad upgrade. But every single day, I am reminded that we have the best country in the entire world. We've got the best workers. We've got the best people. We've got the best cultural and historical traditions in liberty and democracy anywhere in the world. We have the best natural resources. I mean, China and Russia would kill for some of the things that we have right here in our own country, and we have the most beautiful country in the entire world. So as you get out there, and as you knock on doors, and as you send people to win this race, remember that everything in America is going Excuse me, there's everything in America except for our leadership is going great. So the task over the next seven weeks is to give this great and beautiful country the leadership that it deserves. I'm going to fight every single day for it. Donald Trump is going to fight every single day for it. Do not despair. Get out there. Fight for every single vote. And we're going to take this country back and give the American people the leadership that it deserves. Thank you all. God bless you for having me. God bless you for all of your efforts on our part. We couldn't do without you, and I'm so grateful to you. Thank you.